you know. Uh, in my 20s, I really, like, was about that kind of more risky lifestyle. I went skydiving in my 20s. I snowboarded. I, you know, ziplined, paintballed all the time. I just love that adrenaline rush, that, that just, like, feeling alive and, and going out there and doing it. Well, I'm 36 now, and uh, those things are still fun. Don't get me wrong, but also, you know what's fun? Couches. And warm blankets and coffee. Like, I just, those are really good contenders for all that exciting stuff now. Uh, I love comfort. I love just hanging out at home. There's nothing better than putting on the game or watching a movie and ordering pizza and just relaxing. I just love that. And, and all those things are still fun, you know, uh, every now and then. Uh, around graduation time, I'm the youth leader at Sunrise. And, and uh, almost every graduation, there's at least one youth in my group that's like, you know, I really want to go skydiving. Would you go with me? And I'm always like, I mean, that sounds fun, but then my brain's thinking also, like, I remember how sore I was after skydiving, and I don't know if I want to do that again. And, like, when you talk about going paintballing with the youth group, I'm like, that's fun. It's great. I, you know, I have my equipment. It's, it's a good time. But also, I start to remember how hot it was and how wet you get, you know, and all that stuff. And I'm just like, I don't know if I want to do that stuff anymore. Um, you know, in our country, in our culture, comfort is a big deal. We spend a lot of money on comfort. We like comfort. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but sometimes it can be our ultimate thing. It becomes our everything thing. It becomes an all-consuming thing. I mean, even when you uh, buy a car, you're not just usually buying a car. You're buying uh, a nice car that feels nice, has all the safety precautions and everything. And and it's funny to take, like, what we look for in a vehicle, and then you go to another country. Uh, My wife and I, we got to go to Thailand one time, and and we were riding around this little, it's called a tuk-tuk, which basically is a motorcycle with a backing on it. And we're sitting on there, we're all hanging off the side of it, and then we're feeling crazy. But then this family passes us on a moped, and there's five of them on there. It's a mom and a dad, and they're holding their kids like this. <laughs> and my wife just freaked out. She's like, where's the car seat? You know? And I was just thinking, like, that's just their normal. That's what's comfortable to them, right? But we just love our space. We love our comfort. Well, it's, that's fine when it comes to most of life, but when it comes to our faith, when it comes to our faith, that's a different thing. See, what's interesting is our faith, we're, in our faith, we're not called to live comfortable lives. In fact, God's goal for us is not comfort, it's transformation and to be made holy, Anything God calls us to is not to make us comfortable, although he is our comforter in hard times. But he is calling us into transformation. We will no longer be our old selves, but be made new each and every day to be made holy as he is holy. And so we're going to walk through several examples of what that looks like today, uh, starting with the apostles. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 4, verses 7 through 22. And we're going to read one example of what it looks like to have risky faith with God. What, what does that term mean? You know, it's not just a flashy title, but what does it mean to actually have that to be what your faith looks like, to be risky? And so uh, we're going to be uh, jumping in with this story, and the story is of Peter and John. And so let me set the stage before we get to our text today. Uh, Peter and John were on their way to the temple. They were on their way to worship Jesus and, and talk to other people about um, Jesus. And on their way, they passed this uh, homeless guy who's uh, just on the side of the, the building, and, and he is uh, begging for, for food, for, for money. And so Peter turns to him, and the guy gets excited because he thinks he's going to get something. And it turns out the guy also, uh, his legs don't work. Uh, And so Peter comes to him, and he says, you know, I don't have money for you, but what I do have is Jesus. And so he blesses him, and then a miracle happens, and, and the man can all of a sudden walk. And it's a big deal, and everyone's going crazy, and they're like, how are you doing this? And he's saying, well, Jesus. And so he starts preaching about Jesus outside of the temple and starts telling everyone about it. Well, uh, the religious leaders, they don't like that. Uh, they, they want everyone to go into the temple. They want to be the leaders of this thing. And so uh, they start to then uh, arrest them. They arrest them and they bring them in. And then they start to have this little meeting with them. And so that's where we're jumping into the, check, the text. Uh, it's in verse 7 of chapter 4 of Acts. 
And so this is what it says for us. It says, They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he, is, he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it was by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that, is, uh, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus, the stone the builder rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note of these men and had, that they had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then uh, conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a, a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them against speak, speaking no longer to anyone in, the, in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because uh, all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. You ever hear something in the Bible and think, why did they include that? That whole comment of the man was over 40 years old, like, I read that and I was like, why is that a big deal? That's not old, right? Like, <laughs> I was 36, now I'm like, that's nothing. Like, How dare you, Luke? <laughs> you know, make me feel old all of a sudden. Uh, that's one of those things that, like, when I get to heaven, I, you know, uh, however it's going to work, I, I, I uh, plan to talk to Luke about a few things here and there. Like, why didn't you include this? I want more details about how that went down. And also, what's up with the 40 comment, you know? Were you, like, 20-something when you wrote this? You know, and the 40 looked old then? It doesn't now, but... Anyways, other than that, um, I love this story. Peter and John are brought before the, the council and asked, uh, what power and name did you do this miracle by? And Peter is emboldened by the Holy Spirit, steps up and delivers this amazing, challenging message to them. Something for us to take note of is that the Bible makes sure that we understand that Peter is not doing this on his own authority, not on his own account, but it says that the Holy Spirit enables him to do this. It is through the Holy Spirit that he speaks in this uh, amazing way. Uh, and I think part of the reason why the, this is highlighted by the author Luke is because Luke has also written his gospel at this point. He's already told the story of Jesus. And several times through Jesus' story, we have seen Peter step up and say something that wasn't correct, right? There's a lot of times that Peter was quick to speak, but not speak the right things. And so he's trying to help us understand that was Peter before the Holy Spirit, but now that he's walking with the Holy Spirit, now that he has the Holy Spirit, now that he's emboldened by him, he's hitting the mark, right? He's speaking it in a different way. And so when the Holy Spirit enables us to do something, that's different than us just doing something. And I think that's what Luke's kind of trying to help us understand and see through this part. So Peter steps up, and I love what he says. He says, let's make sure that you and everyone else who hears this story understands this point of how we did this. That Jesus, you know, the one you guys crucified, the one you guys murdered in that false trial that you guys put on, that Jesus that I'm talking about right here, the one that rose from the dead because God, yeah, that's whose name we did this through. That's the power that we do this through. And they didn't know what to say. 
What do you say to that? The man's standing right there. He's not supposed to be able to stand, and yet he's there. There's nothing they, they, could, they could say. And then Peter continues. He, he uh, references Psalms 118, verse 22, and then says, The stone the builders reject, which has become the cornerstone, and salvation has, is found in no one else's name, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. This is such a major part for Peter and John. I mean, they, these guys are leaders in the church right now. It's a very, the church is very young at this point, right? It's a couple chapters old <laughs> in that sense. But these two are trusting in Jesus as they're being wrongfully accused, as they're being jailed. I mean, these two have seen firsthand that these religious leaders do not mind bending the rules a bit when it fits them. They saw what happened to Jesus firsthand, and yet they are ready to commit themselves to walk that same road now, just to, 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 to go to the cross just like Jesus did. They said, I don't care, but we're going to continue to speak about Jesus. So you do whatever you got to do, but for us, we're going to keep preaching the good news. This is a major step in Peter. I mean, Peter, I mean, the, if we see back in the, uh, the Gospels, Peter was so afraid of getting caught about knowing Jesus that he lied to a slave girl. She had no power, no authority over him, and yet he was so worried that uh, he was going to get caught that by knowing Jesus, he was going to freak out, right? And so he lied three times of even knowing Jesus. That's Peter before the Holy Spirit. But now that he's walking with the Holy Spirit, now that he has it dwelling within him, he's living in a new way, fearless, bold, ready to go wherever Jesus has him to go. He speaks with boldness because of the Holy Spirit in his life. The leaders, the leader team, they struggle. They don't know what to do with him, these two guys. And so they try to threaten him, but they, they don't want anything to do with that. See, their, their advice to them was like, you know what? It's good that you know Jesus. Just keep that to yourself. Just, just let us coexist, you know? Let's just coexist with what's happening here. Uh, you, you do you, but keep your religious ideas, your thoughts, all that to yourself. Don't, don't share that with anyone, and then we'll be good. We'll leave you alone, and you'll leave us alone, and everyone can be happy. I mean, you're going to heaven. We'll go wherever we think we're going to go. That's the goal. Just live a comfortable life. But they know that God does not call us to a comfortable life. He calls us to a transformed, holy life. I think this is uh, a crazy showing of what a risky life looks like, what a risky faith looks like. We look at that and we say, man, that, that's crazy. I don't know if I could ever be that person who steps up and speaks out and share God's name that way. But, but we're called to. We're always called to speak and share the hope that we have within us, the, the, why we have the hope. Danny talked about that two weeks ago, right, where he talked about the fact that we should be ready to share that good news. And any one of us could be called to, to share why we have our faith at any moment. And then part of being risky might be being willing to step up, to speak out, to share that good news any place that we are. But God also has risks for each one of us in different ways. Uh, I'm going to hit on this a few times, no matter, you know, in, in our, my sermon. But for each one of us, what looks risky to you might look risky or not so risky for someone else. Each one of us has a different level of our walk and where we're at with him. And so for each one of us, that risk factor of trusting Jesus, of, of our heart being like, Jesus, if you don't show up, this isn't going to work. It's going to look different for each one of us. And so for one example here, we see... The, or the apostles stepping up and speaking before leaders, sharing the testimony, preaching, basically. And, and that might be what it looks like for you to step up and take a risk with your faith. But I want to look at another example for us. We're going to be in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 through 30, and look at another example of what risky faith could look like. And so, again, let me give you some context of what's happening here. Uh, there's this guy named Saul. Um, he is uh, someone who is an enemy of the church. He hates the church. He wants to destroy it. He believes that this is just a cult, this Christian thing, this Jesus movement that's happening. He thinks it's a cult, and he needs to crush it. And so he, being a, a, a righteous Jew, uh, thinks that it's his God-given right and his, his duty to, to smash this. 
And so he goes out and he's chasing the church. He's jailing people. He's, he's trying to destroy what, uh, what Jesus is doing. And he thinks Jesus is just this crazy dude. And so uh, he's going after it with everything that he can. And so he's on his way to go arrest more people in a far off land. And on his way, he gets hit with Jesus. Jesus shows up. And then they have a conversation. And at the end of that conversation, Saul realizes Oh man, Jesus is the Messiah. That changes everything. And, and uh, so he basically does a 180 in his life and starts following Jesus. And he goes out and he starts preaching about Jesus and, and doing it so much so that the people, the Jewish uh, temple that he was at uh, starts to try to kill him because they're saying, this guy, he's a traitor. We got to destroy him. He's, he's for Jesus. No, we got to cut him out. So he has to take off and go to Jerusalem. And, and find coverage with the church there. And that's where we're going to pick up our, our story on Acts 9, verse 26. And it says, uh, when he came to Jerusalem, he being Saul, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. So he goes to Jerusalem thinking, I'm going to find my brother and sisterhood, right? I'm going to find my family of, of Christians. I'm going to go there and find that cover uh, and he gets there and he finds his past daunting over him, right? The, the, the church is like, nah, uh we're not dumb, you know, we're not stupid here. We're not just going to let you come in and figure out how we work and take us down from the inside. You're like the dude. You're, no, you're on number one on the hit list of people that we've been praying for. No, 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 no. Like, yeah, this isn't going to work. We're not just going to let you in. And so he, he's kicked out. He's left on his own for a bit. And what's amazing is, is something for us to understand. You know, Jesus forgives us, but the consequences of our past life still sometimes have consequences. You know, Jesus forgives you, but there's still some reconciliation that takes time to heal. You know, it takes time to mend those relationships, to, to fix those wrongs that have happened. You know, it's that process of being made holy. It's not just a, and you're, you're Jesus. <laughs> no, you're, you're justified as Jesus is. But being sanctified, being made holy is a lifetime process that Jesus walks with us, that the Holy Spirit enables us to do. And so uh, continuing the story, verse 27 and 28 says, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him. And how the, in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. So Barnabas comes out and connects with Saul. He goes out and he connects with him. He hears his story, hears his testimony, hears his heart, and he just starts to see, man, this guy loves Jesus. He, 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 he understands that this guy truly is a disciple. And so he brings Saul to the rest of the church and he puts his seal of approval and says, this man is a man for Jesus. He's one of us. See, Barnabas was taking a risk by meeting Saul just by itself. That interaction. Barnabas was a leader in the church then. Uh, he was one of the people, the Acts says just a few chapters before that, that he gave a large amount of uh, land up to give to the church, to fund the church. And so he was an all-in kind of leader. Uh, he gave of his possessions so that everyone could, uh, you know, have enough. And, and so he was a great leader in the church already. So he would have been a great, like, get for Saul just by himself. Saul's like, I can't get into the church. I'll at least get one of their great leaders, you know, and take them down. But Saul truly was a believer. So Barnabas took a risk by even just meeting with him and then takes another risk by just giving his stamp of approval onto Saul. What we can highlight from this story is that risk can look different. You know, as we said, it could look like standing up in front of people and delivering a message about Jesus. It could look like a friendship. Just going and connecting with someone, starting a conversation. We see that in Acts chapter 7. Uh, Philip is walking along and he risks a moment of awkwardness as he goes to a, a man and says, do you know what you're reading? Let me explain it to you. Whatever that risk looks like for each one of us, it's different. But we have to rely on God to come through. So whatever it is, the step will take intentionality and sacrifice. It makes us feel uneasy at times 
when we have to risk so much. And many of us, honestly, worry about even like saying hi to a stranger, right? We don't even know if we want to risk that much to have an awkward hello with someone or to get too involved. At least maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but sometimes I don't look at a stranger walking by because I'm just like, I don't want to get into it, right? I don't want to say hi. I don't want to, I, I, sometimes it's hard to be friendly all the time, right? And so sometimes we don't even want to risk that kind of relationship, but maybe that's what God is exactly calling us to, to step out of our comfort zone, what makes us happy or makes us feel great. See, uh, Jesus, he called us not to a warm church or a, or a couch with blankets. Instead, let's turn to Matthew uh, uh, chapter 16, verses 24 and 26, and let's see what Jesus calls us to. It says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves Take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants, to be saved, uh, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever wants to lose their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? For what, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Jesus is saying this actually right after he tells the disciples that he's going to suffer and die for them. And, and what's amazing is right after he says that, the first time he brings that up to the disciples, uh, Peter pulls him to the side. And he says, uh, Jesus, I, I don't think that's a good plan. He says, I, I, I think we should go a different direction. That doesn't sound very comfortable. I think, uh, what if instead of you dying, uh, you didn't, um, and then uh, you just became king and made Israel like, you know, what, what's the Messiah supposed to do? Make Israel great and be a conquering king and all of these things. Why don't you do that instead of dying? Like, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't go with what I, I think we should be doing. And Jesus turned to him and says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and you do not have in mind or, uh, the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus is challenging Peter to follow him out of his comfort zone and into a life of taking risks, a life of faith, but to do that with God. Not just to live a risky lifestyle, but to do it with God. And that brings us into a, a good conversation by itself. Uh, there is a difference between risky faith and recklessness. All right? Risky faith, what does that mean? Uh, well, I got some points up here, uh, I believe, of uh, what risky faith can look like. It, it means that God is calling you, is one of the, the stipulations. If God's calling you to it, um, it there's uh, lines in scripture. It's not just like this like movement in your heart and your head of God saying, hey, mate, you should do this, but also you can go to scripture and say, oh yeah, that lines up with what is here. You know, scripture always aligns with something that God's telling you to do. Right? It's never gonna be like God tells you something and you'll be like, I don't see that anywhere in scripture. Guess I gotta do it. Nope. That's not Jesus. That's something else. And so we look to Scripture to understand, to put on the glasses of interpretation for, for what the Spirit's calling us to do. And then if it's a big thing, you can also go to your community. And you can say, hey, I feel like God's calling me to do this. Maybe it's start a, a small group. Maybe it's to, to make a change in your career or, or something big. You, you go to your community that God has placed around you, godly people, and you, you throw it out to them. And you say, will you pray with me on this? Well, we, can we kind of sort this out together? And through the confirmation of the community, you, you find alignment. You understand this is what God's calling me to do. Even if I'm not comfortable, even if it cause, makes, me, makes my heart race a little bit, God's calling you to do it. And there's a reliance on God's empowerment. It's not, oh, I'm smart enough, I'm wise enough, I'm rich enough, I'm whatever enough. It's, I need Jesus to come through or this thing's going to fail. And that's where we want to be. Recklessness on the other side, it just comes from us. It just says, yeah, I think this is a great idea. Let's do it. Is it with scripture? I don't know. I'm sure. It sounds like, I don't know. I think so. Oh, uh, you better go check, right? That's recklessness. It, it, little alignment with scripture, if at all. Uh, no connection with your community. You don't want to tell anyone in the church about what you're doing, right? That's shady. You know, that's probably not something you're supposed to be doing, right? If you're keeping secrets, that's usually a sign. Uh, and, and the last one is, it's all about self-empowerment. It's me. I can do this. I'm strong enough. 
That's how you know you're being reckless with your life, and that's not what God's calling us to do. Risky faith is what God calls us to, where we rely on him to, to come through. A major difference between the two is what we see from Acts 4 with Peter and Matthew 24. Peter, in his self-assurance, his recklessness, tells Jesus what to do. And in Acts 4, we see the flip where the Holy Spirit is enabling him to speak Jesus' truth to people around him. So here's the major question for us. What is God calling you personally to do? What does living a risky faith look like for each one of you? Like, again, for each one of you, it's different. For some of you, uh, that question could be uh, starting a conversation with someone that you've just kind of felt like God might be calling you to talk to that person, but you're not sure, you don't know where they're at, you don't know if you want to get involved, you have to give up more time, all that stuff, risking and hurt. But maybe that's exactly what God's calling you to do. Maybe, it, maybe it's just a simple hello. Maybe it's an invitation to church. Maybe it is to start a small group. Maybe it is to go to, to the Madrid's house or office and, and connect and risk being exposed and, and growing with God. Oh, man. Maybe that's what risky faith looks like to you, to, to actually trust a church again. Because I know some of us have been deeply hurt by church and maybe it's just being willing to risk it again and see if this church, God wants to do something different today. Because I think he does. Whatever that looks like for you personally, that's between you and the Holy Spirit. But my, my, my hope for you is that you would step into that. That you would step into that. Because in there, in God's presence, that's truly where we find security. He is our ultimate comforter. And if, when we risk it with God, that's where we find everything that we possibly could need. So that's my first question for you. You personally, what does it look like for you to risk? And here's my second question. Imago Church, what does it look like for Imago Church to take some risks? What does it look like for you guys to step into what God has for you? And I, I know some of the things that you guys got in front of you. You guys got some big challenges in front of you with having to change locations, all the things swirling around you guys. And there's, this is a risky time. Some of these decisions you guys got in front of you, there can be a desire, let's just, let's just be comfortable. Let's just go with what we know. Let's go with what's easy. That sounds great. But maybe the conversation needs to be, where is God wanting to plant us? What community do we need to be blessing with our community? Where, where, what does God have for us? And, and let's risk it. Let's rely on Jesus to come through. So don't just settle for what's comfortable, but to push in Imago Church what does God have for you and to risk it for him? That is my question for you guys to start to pray about. You know, the things that you guys have in front of you, honestly, could, are the things that in churches. And we see that all the time. There's several hundreds of churches around here whose names we don't remember because they didn't make it. And we don't want Amago to do that. Not that I think that's what's happening, but it's just the challenge in front of you. So we have to step out on that ledge with God and say, I trust you. Realizing that on the ledge with God is the safest place that we can live our life. Not, not in the corner, but on that edge with Jesus where we say, I trust you, that you're holding me nice and firm. More than my feet are stable on this ground, I trust you. And that's where we live our life as Christians. And so what is God calling you personally to do in your risky faith, and what is Imago Church called to do? That is my prayer and my message for you guys today. Let me pray for you guys and invite the worship team to come forward. God, I thank you so much that you don't leave us in the corner, you don't put us on the shelf just collecting dust and saying, I'll get to you one day, uh, uh, wait till heaven and then you'll understand. You, you call us to live a holy life here today. God, I thank you so much for the, the Jewish tradition where it wasn't about afterlife, God. The Jewish tradition doesn't actually care a lot about uh, life after death. Actually, it, it's all about the here and now, that we have today to serve you, right now to walk with you, to be made holy because of you. That you gave us right now, here today, physically today, to worship your name. And God, I pray that you would help us to step out of our comfort zones, to risk awkwardness, to risk feeling any kind of nervousness to, to take a risk with you, Jesus. 
give us confirmation from your word, God, of what you're calling us to do. God, I thank you that even risk doesn't equal success. That's not the end goal. The, the end goal is the trust that is built as we step out with you. So just the fact that we said, God, I'm trusting you in this is already victory enough. So God, I pray that you would help us each individually to right now, Holy Spirit, put in our head and our heart, this is what I'm calling you to do this week. And I want you to read your scripture more and trust that that is gonna make a difference in your day. I know that you're busy and 15 minutes sounds like a lot, but I'm, I'm calling you to read your word and trust that it's gonna be made worth it. That prayer works, God. We risk trusting in you and pray wholeheartedly saying, God, I need you to come into my situations in my life and do amazing things. To risk a conversation, to voicing up in Bible study, to risking a relationship, to call out to someone that we need to ask for forgiveness today, God. Just that you would just help us to risk being exposed and trust that you have nothing but holiness, sanctifying us, justification for us, and a new, new life transformed by you. Thank you, you don't leave us where we're at, but you, you're constantly working with us. And help us to start to live into that today. And it's in your name we pray.